Hello. So one of the things that I find quite interesting is often the more bro community um, or the more mainstream bodybuilding, bodybuilding community or lifting community is less likely to take advantage of some of the more sort of sciencey tools. So one of the tools that I'm talking about today is rate of perceived exertion. What the fuck is that? So to give a little background, what I think is quite cool is this tool is used a lot in science. We use it in science to measure perceived exertion or we measure intensity with it. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about exactly what the tool is in a second, but one of the cool things is influencers are actually now making it clear that they use this tool. So Lex Little, he's this, I would say potentially natural guy. He's a Gymshark athlete, um, really jacked, like looks ridiculous. I would be unsurprised if he wasn't natty, but I would bet he might be, doesn't matter. Um, really is irrelevant to the discussion. Um, but he uses RPE. And he, like, there's a bit, there's a few different examples proving that he's using the RPE that was invented, the RPE scale that was invented by Helms and Zordos. So, or pioneered, I would say, by Helms and Zordos. I think it was Mike Toucher who originally created the system. I've got a full podcast on the RPE scale um, in total nerd fashion. Um, but I, I think it would be useful to explain how they use this. So, how these influences, James English, Lex Little, how they use this scale to get more jacked, how they use it to gain more muscle, get stronger, etc. These guys are making progress all the damn time. Um, these guys continue to make progress. And one of the reasons they do that is they actually train pretty intelligently. So what they post on their Instagram for the most part is them doing a one rep max, They're, them getting a PR, them screaming, them blah, blah, blah. But what are they doing 99% of the time? So Lex is actually coached by a very, very good powerlifting coach, Sean Noriega. So he is pretty world renowned in terms of powerlifting. He's a pretty damn good coach. I believe he also coached Russ Swole um, or Russell Orhi, although I might be, that might be a gap in my knowledge. I'm, that might be wrong, but he's a very, very prominent coach. He knows his shit. Um, he's also a very good powerlifter himself, strong as fuck. Um, so I thought I'd explain a little bit about how they use RPE to gain more muscle than you would otherwise. That's pretty damn clear. So I'll show the title to an article here by Mass. So this article basically outlines you, in general, it's pretty well proven that you do gain more muscle if you work submaximally most of the time. Now I've preached on this a lot. However, one of the main issues that people come up with, um, and it, it's a very, very valid issue is how do you actually know if you're at failure? So what I mean by submaximal training is if you're quite far from failure, you're submaximal, you're training submaximally. Anything before failure is submaximal. So basically you're comparing training to failure every single time versus training not to failure every single time. And then there's a, a spectrum of how far from failure we can go. Um, there's different advice on what you should do as a beginner, but in general, your, your rating of perceived exertion basically elucidates how far you are from failure. Um, it's not a, a rating of how hard that was out of 10. It's not a rating of how difficult do I perceive this to be. It's a, it's a relatively, it's a subjective method that we use to measure how far or how many repetitions someone has left in the tank. Or it's, we would call this the RIR based RPE scale. So you have RPE, you have RPE. It's a one to 10 scale. Um, however, the most important part is that 10 equals zero reps left. And then nine equals one rep. Eight equals two reps. Seven equals three, six equals four. And it changes a little bit past there. But for now, we're just gonna focus on this area. So why, why would I focus on this area specifically? So anything from four to here, in the research generally tends to say that this equals the same equals the same strength plus hypertrophy or increase in muscle size or muscle gain gains so you'll gain the same amount if volume is equated so if you're doing the same amount of work but the number of hard sets um, hard being anything from 4 RIR and above or a 6 RPE and above, um, that generally 
means that you're going to end up having, you're generally going to basically have, um, that generally means you're going to make the same amount of progress. So for the most part, people like Lex Little, James English, probably David Laid as well, all kinds of people like that, they're going to be using the the reps and reserve RPE scale. Even if they're not necessarily using that scale, they're using the principles of it, which is, for the most part, train a lot of the time sub-maximally. But in general, we found it most useful. Um, so my friend and, I guess you would say, colleague, we collaborate sometimes, I'm Eric Helms, he's done, he, I believe his PhD was actually in comparing the other, the other sort of version of this that is commonly used in powerlifting, which is percentage, um, percentage based on 1RM, um, or 1 rep max, so a percentage of how much you could do for 1 rep. Um, he compared that to RPE, and RPE generally tends to have more cross-application for sports like bodybuilding. If, you, like, if your goal is to be a power builder and to gain muscle, RPE is probably a good thing to learn. Um, so I'm going to link a few resources down below on how specifically some more resources around RPE. Um, but for the most part, it's just to get this, um, get this general idea. And then what, what makes RPE it accurate or not? So what makes you able to actually do anything with this? What makes it so you can actually perceive how far you are from failure? So in general, the longer, the longer you use it, you increase your accuracy. Sorry for my terrible handwriting. Um, but the longer you use it, accuracy. And so we, we call that sort of like an anchoring. Like the more you've used it on different exercises in different contexts, under different phases throughout your training, um, you're going to be able to perceive your relative intensity or your rate of perceived exertion or your distance from failure um, much, much better. So you're going to be able to do that better. Um, Another thing is also in the lower rep ranges. You're going to be able to perceive it a lot better. So if you're doing three reps, um, generally, technically, if you're doing a three rep max, you can it can only be a seven RPE if it is a three rep max. Um, but if it's just something in the free, three rep range, if it's a six RPE on your final rep, so you've, you've done one, two, three reps, and then that one, is a 6 RPE, that means from this point, you still have quite a few reps left. So from, from this point, you still have four reps left in the tank. However, if that one was a 6 RPE, then you'll note that, and you would generally do the last rep. You, you're never really going to, this is just sort of trying to explain it. You would never in theory or never practically rate the first rep and then the second rep and third rep. You just rate the last rep. Um, but you're in your head kind of counting as you go and sort of keeping in mind where you are within that sort of scale of perceived exertion. Um, so if that one was a 6 RPE, you would then have four reps left there. So then this would be a 9 RPE. If that was a 6. I hope that makes sense. Um, so then how should we use, use RPE as we get to the higher rep ranges. So say if you're doing a set of 10 to 15, 10 to 15 on quadricep extension. So quadricep extension, basically that machine where you've got your legs like here, foot here, and you just extend up here, your quads are here. It's a terrible drawing. Um, you should generally be holding on. Um, so that's, that's your quadricep extension, your amazing drawing of that. Um, so, and then with this, how should you use RPE? Because it's a little bit harder to gauge. It's harder to gauge, oh, how far from failure actually am I? I've, I've done 12 reps. Shit, this hurts. Am I close to failure? Um, so, in general, what I personally think, and I, this is relatively well supported, although, although there is some disagreement within the evidence-based community, um, I think in a higher rep range, if you have a higher, so if, you, if your rep range, let me, if your rep ranges increase at higher rep ranges in an isolation movement, I am 
very, very rarely going to prescribe um, anything over a 2 RIR. Simply because I think no matter how experienced you are with, rating, with ratings of perceived exertion, um, 2 RIR, or that, that equals 8 RPE, that's the same thing. RPE, can't spell. Um, so that's an 8 RPE. So you've got two reps, in re two reps in reserve or two reps left in the tank or 8 RPE. Um, I think that's a good range because you know, it's generally pretty easy to tell then. And it's just about getting close enough to failure. And so what, why do we even want to work so maximally? So it might say in the research that it leads to better outcomes, but how can? what's the theory behind this? How does this actually work? So the main thing is fatigue. So what is, what, what is fatigue? Fatigue basically builds up, builds up, what is going on? Um, fatigue basically builds up over the meso cycle, so over your over your period of training before you deload. So I, I'm hoping that you deload. Deloading is really quite important because um, without that, you don't have an ability to dissipate fatigue, and fatigue pretty much directly interrupts adaptations and directly interrupts growth. So you do need to deload. So let's say this is your period of training. This is your period of training. Um, and then this is fatigue. In general, fatigue will increase. Um, so let's just say that's a normal line of fatigue over time. Um, but now let's say if we do... So let's say that is using RIR. Um, and let's say a volume is equated. Um, and let's say this point is deload. And that might be six weeks. That would be relatively standard. And then let's say this point, this might be failure every set. Um, some people would dispute this, but I think this is relatively well, this is quite concrete within the scientific literature. I've, I've made it clear, people like Lex use it, so he's, uh, he's progressing really, really well. He uses it. He's one of the genetic freaks. You look at him and you're just like, holy shit, what the fuck is on his legs? That is a, that is a, that is, that leg is the size of a cow. He looks ridiculous. He looks insane. He's strong as fuck. He's like 19. So it's obvious that it works. Um, so that's, I'm just going to leave that there and not argue whether it works or not. If you would like to debate me in the comments, feel free. Um, that doesn't mean you should never go to failure, but let's say if you go from two RIR to zero on your last week. So your last week you'll have zero versus failure the whole time. If you have failure the whole time, you might need to deload after four weeks or five, depending on the person. Or these are just numbers I'm throwing out there. If it was me personally, it would probably be three weeks, which isn't that productive, I would say, because my main goal is gaining muscle or hypertrophy. And hypertrophy... It's not an adaptation that happens quickly. So hypertrophy happens when there is an MPS muscle protein. This might not. There's, there's an increase. It's like a calorie balance, but it's muscle protein synthesis. Um, so when muscle protein synthesis is in a positive balance over time, let's say that's, that's balance. Um, if MPS is in general over here, over time, you will gain muscle. So that might be a little complex or going a little bit too far. I'm trying to keep it quite simple. That is quite simple in general, but yeah. So then you could have muscle protein um, positive, muscle protein negative. Um, and in general, if you're spending the most time above that, you'll be gaining muscle. Um, and to do that every time you deload, you're generally going to go down here just because you're not really giving yourself the stimulus um, and your main goal there is to dissipate fatigue because when fatigue goes too high, you will also end up down here. So I hope that's kind of clear. Maybe that elucidated some of us for some people. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, I think it's cool to see people like Lex using this. Um, it's, I've also made it clear James English uses this as well. I use it. Steve Hall uses this, Mike Isratel uses this, Eric Helms uses this. 
Meadow Hanselman's, Greg Knuckles, like it's pretty well um, established within the scientific literature. If you look at the best powerlifters in the world, the best powerlifters in the world all train submaximally a majority of the time. I could say that pretty unanimously. They might have one or two or like a few sets to failure within their session, but no one's going in there on their big compound lifts. Um, being a world-class competitor, all things being equal, going to failure every single session and being world-class. That's not really happening. Sometimes in bodybuilding, that is occurring. Um, however, there's a lot of other variables that go into unassisted, unnatural bodybuilding that lead to that. If you look at some of the best natural bodybuilders in the world, there's a little bit more disagreement on whether you should train to failure or not train to failure. Um, and that's a whole other topic, but this is kind of giving you a framework to not train to failure. Um, if you want any advice on how to implement it yourself, feel free to DM me on Instagram, send me a message, um, and I should be able to help you out. Because um, it's, yeah, it's a tough topic to grasp. Well, once you grasp, um, it's really, really cool. I use it with all my clients, um, and it, it's done some pretty damn good progress so far. So, yeah, I... It's not exactly a strategy, it just it's it is sort of logical within sports science. So um yeah. If you want to train to failure every single session, that's fine. But at a there does come a point where you have to admit you're just not making as much progress as you would be. Um that is just how it is. If you'd like to refute that, comment down below. That's not a unanimously held belief, except it is within science. So it depends if you agree with science or not. Um However, that does not mean that you should never train to failure. It's just it means you shouldn't always train to failure. Um, failure is a really important aspect of hypertrophy and strength training. So there's my rant over. Um, I hope you enjoyed and thank you for watching.